Spirit, that the spirit and the flesh are opposed to one another. Um, they are two different ways of life. They are two different orientations to life. Um, and the two do not mix. The two do not um, go together. And so he continues um, in helping, uh, helping his Galatian readers, hearers, um, as well as us to understand um, what is it really that is the difference between um, life in the flesh and life by the Spirit? So he says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against thing, these such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Lord God, we uh, ask simply that uh, indeed... Um, as we seek to walk in step with your spirit, that we would um, be attentive to the spirits moving now in our listening, in our hearing of your word. Bless the words, Lord God, of my mouth. And bless the meditations, the, the understanding of our hearts for your kingdom's sake. Amen. One true gospel that we uh, engage here last week, um, again, we talked about being freed for love. The fact that we have been set free by the Spirit, um, to walk by the Spirit. And here, here's a quick note. Somebody had asked as uh, they were leaving um, worship last week, um, shouldn't it be in the Spirit? And, and so here's just a little technical detail so you understand there's a difference between when Paul says in the Spirit and by the Spirit. There's no preposition here. Um, it is intended, the language in the Greek is intended to say that we live by the power, we walk by the power of the Spirit. Okay? By the Spirit's influence and presence. Okay? Um, that's the Remember the indicative, Paul describing, here's the way things are. You walk by the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit. Therefore, here is how you ought to live. And so we, we move to this, um, this second part of Paul's imperative. Um, him saying, here is how you ought to live. This is what ought to characterize your lives, your actual behavior. And, um, and I call the spirit rhythms, okay, because, um, because towards the end of the passage there, he talks about being in step with the spirit, that the spirit is the one who sets um, the rhythm for us. And we learn to attend to the spirit's drumbeat, the spirit's words that, that help to um, provide the cadence by which we walk in life. As Paul begins this uh, section, though, um, it's important to recognize this, okay? When he's talking about the works of the flesh, it's not rocket science. There's nothing complicated, says Paul, about recognizing the works of the flesh. There's no complicated formula or anything like that. 
um, he says, um, these things are apparent. It is clear what the works of the flesh are. And, and here's the thing. Paul is saying this in the year, um, or, you know, in our accounting, according to Jesus' resurrection, um, Jesus' birth um, and, and life and, and resurrection. He's writing this um, probably around the year 49 or so. Okay. Um, and he's saying back then that it was absolutely clear and nothing has changed since then. That the ways of the flesh, the works of the flesh, um, are abundantly clear. The other thing here about Paul's words about the works of the flesh is this, that they, this is not an exhaustive list. So he adds that little phrase at the end, and such things. So don't think that you can go down a list and check it off and say, oh, I'm, that's not, that's not, none of those are me. And so I'm good to go. No, he says, um, we, we know, and he's dealing with specific concerns for the Galatians, but we too know um, we don't have to be experts in ethics to know what is contrary to the kingdom of God. What it is, what kind of behavior and lifestyle runs counter to the kingdom and to, the, to life by the Spirit. So in that list, uh, without going in detail, um, note this, that um, as you read that list in um, the NIV translation, they provide some semicolons. Okay, so you don't have to look at this right now, but go back and check it out. And it's Paul's, uh, it's the translator's way of trying to identify Paul's um, recognition of kind of four different areas. He begins um, with three words that deal with sexual immorality. Um, and, again, here's the reminder. The reminder is this, that our world today is no worse, no better than the world of um, the first century when Paul is writing. Back then, they are dealing with the absolute same um, perversions of sexual, God's intention for sexuality um, for human beings. They're dealing with the same ways of, of rebelling against God's purposes then as we do today. Why do those head up Paul's list? Why, do they, why are they there um, at the very start? Maybe it's just, um, maybe that's just where Paul chooses. Maybe there's not a purpose or a reason. But it could be this, that it is our sexuality. In, our, in the practice of our sexuality, Paul says in another place, is where we um, potentially sin against even our own body because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. It could be that, that um, the enemy has so perverted what is one of God's most beautiful gifts for a man and a woman joined together in the covenant of marriage that the enemy has taken this most beautiful of gift and has used it as one of his primary instruments of creating havoc in the creation and driving humankind apart, breaking them apart. I guess my suspicion is that's why it shows up first. That it becomes, um, it is in the time of Paul in the Greco-Roman Empire, it is... Um, it is a primary um, point of contention with regard to what it means to be a child of God versus what it means to be a child of the world. And it's the same today. If you continue through that list, the next several um, words that are separated by semicolon are words that deal with, um, with those, uh, those perspectives or behaviors that break a community apart dissensions, factions, envy, jealousy. These are things that, that tear people apart, that break down community instead of building community up. And, and in the end, that is Paul's primary concern with the Galatians that, and, and any church to which he writes. He wants for the church of Jesus Christ to be whole, that we are a body, that we are connected with very different people, very different places in life, very different sets of priorities and agendas, and yet we are called to be of one mind and one spirit. And the works of the flesh 
drive us apart from each other. That third um, set, uh, set couple of words are words that deal with um, the political realm, the, the, um, the things that break apart um, the greater um, community. And the last two are words that, uh, that are borrowed from, are taken from um, the slash religious um, revelry. Uh, the party that goes along with the false religion of the Galatian world and ours. Now here's the thing. What Paul um, says about the works of the flesh, he reserves his strongest condemnation for the works of the flesh and those who, uh, who are engaged in the works of the flesh. He says, those who practice such as these will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Paul's strongest way of saying that if your life is characterized by this particular pattern of life, that you have no place in the kingdom of God, present or future. That's the strongest way that Paul can put it. He doesn't say use that language frequently. He reserves it for those places where he is trying to drive home the point that should you choose this pattern of life, you place yourself outside of the covenant community. Now, here's what's important to recognize. That when Paul uses this strong language of condemnation, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, does that mean that we who, um, every one of us, struggles with sin? And we can look at that, with the works of the flesh, and we can say, oh yeah, that's me, that's me. Here's the difference, the way that Timothy George um, puts it. Actually, John Calvin is the first quote here. Um, here's how John Calvin puts it in dealing with this um, question. But in this way, we shall be told all are cut off from the hope of salvation. That is, when Paul says none will inherit the kingdom of God who practice such things, this is how we are being told that we're cut off from all hope of salvation. For who is there that is not chargeable with some of these sins? I reply, Paul does not threaten that all who have sinned but that all who remain impenitent shall be excluded from the kingdom of God. The saints themselves often fall into grievous sins, but they return to the path of righteousness. We come back to the table. We come back to Jesus. We lay ourselves at the feet of Jesus and, and, and at the cross of Jesus, and we say, um, we repent. We acknowledge our need for grace. We invite afresh the Spirit to work um, his, his miracle of recreation again. But those who are impenitent, they are the ones um, of whom Paul speaks. That which they do, they um, allow not, and therefore they are not included in this catalog, says Paul. Those who are penitent, are, who, who repent. All the threatenings of judgment of God call us to repentance. And they are accompanied by a promise that those who repent will obtain forgiveness. But if we continue, uh, if, but if we continue obstinate, they remain as a testimony from heaven against us. And that's the word that we proclaim to our neighbors, to our friends, to our colleagues, to our fellow family members. That indeed, that the works of the flesh are not um, by themselves um, condemnation, but, but the one who fails to hear the Spirit's call in naming sin for what it is, in calling to repentance, for those who, who fail to respond to that call to, to repent, to um, ask for forgiveness, um, it becomes testimony from heaven against us. Paul did not contrast the works of the flesh with opposing works of the spirit. Note this. That the works of the flesh are the products of fallen human beings and their devising, conniving, and manufacturing in the sense of made with one's own hands. Efforts at self-actualization. So that's the way our world would put it, right? Uh, those works of the flesh are the ways that you um, pursue happiness, that you pursue um, getting your rightful hold on your part of the creation so that you protect your own security and happiness in life. From the Tower of Babel to modern totalitarianism, from Aaron's golden calf to contemporary idols of money, sex, and power, 
The works of the flesh have littered the human landscape with misery. 9-11 is, um, is no exception. 9-11 is simply um, the fruit, the works of the flesh being um, worked out um, on mass scale. You know, and the crazy thing is, is this, that we as Americans woke up to this um, in a profound way on 9-11 when much of the rest of the world has been dealing with the same kind of violence and hatred and brokenness um, for, for many, many years and decades. We can go around the world, um, uh, we can look back in a short history of the 20th century and see similar places where the same kind of violence is perpetrated by terrorists, by those who, um, who because of the works of the flesh, pursue idolatry in such a way that it wreaks havoc upon the world. But when Paul proceeded to describe the modality of the Spirit, life according to the Spirit, by the Spirit, he deliberately shifted from the language of technology. Technology that we have means is something that we control. We control technology. We build and make and create. He switches from technology to what? Um, to nature. To the world of, uh, of the natural order. Why? Because we don't control, do we? Do we cause the rain to, to fall? Do we cause the fruit to form? Do we cause the plants to grow? Do we cause the sun to come up by day and to go down by night? We control none of it. it. It comes as a gift from God. And so Paul switches his focus here as he's talking about the Spirit and he says, um, let's shift gears. We're no longer thinking about what we control, but indeed what we receive, what we participate in. Are we walking by the Spirit? This becomes the question. How do we know if we're walking by the Spirit? And Paul says, um, you'll know because of the fruit that you bear. And fruit there is singular, not plural. In other words, these are to be taken together. These are, um, these are a holistic um, picture of what the life of the community of God's people looks like God's people are characterized by this spirit-led um, quality, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And Paul isn't inventing this, right? Um, what does Jesus say uh, when he's confronted, when he is confronted by the legalism of the Pharisees, he says what? Um, here's how you will know my true disciples by the fruit that they bear. You, you will look at them and they will be trees that bear fruit that you expect from one that is connected to me. If we are connected to Jesus, uh, the world ought to expect to see fruit hanging from our branches that matches the, the fruit of Jesus' life. And the fruit of Jesus' life is like the works of the flesh, is unmistakable. It's not rocket science. We know what causes dissension among us. We know what causes um, discord among us. We know what causes um, havoc in our personal lives and our collective life. And we know as well what will make for health, shalom, peace, goodness, faithfulness to the mission of God. Are we bearing fruit? It would do us as well to spend this coming week memorizing that simple passage from Paul's letter, memorizing the fruit of the Spirit. That those um, would shape our imagination of who we ought to be individually and as God's people here at Mount Pisgah. The way that we bear fruit is by keeping time with the Spirit, says Jesus. Um, we keep time, we keep step with the Spirit's cadence. The language that he uses is drawn from the military. Um, that there, uh, there is someone who is providing the commands that, that, that issues forth the cadence by which the military marches um, in one line, in one step, with one purpose. And that's, that is the Lord's purpose for us through the Spirit. That as we more and more come to 
put ourselves in step with the Spirit, walking in step with the Spirit's cadences, we will bear fruit of the Spirit. We will be the kind of people who God wants us to be so that we can be to the world a source of light and hope. And how do we put ourselves in step with the Spirit? It's not rocket science. There is nothing profound, there's no profound mystery to uncover. Uh, Jesus says what? I'm going to send my spirit, and my spirit is going to call to your mind a remembrance of what? My words. When you obey my commands, you're my friends. When you obey my commands, you remain in me, to use Jesus' own language of fruit bearing. And you're going to bear much fruit. When you remember my words in, in, the, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus tells the parable about the sower, um, he ends that parable about the sower, um, talking about bearing fruit. And bear, fruit is born because the words of Jesus have taken root in, deep in the heart, and they bear fruit. The words of Jesus is how the Spirit um, provides cadence for our lives. It's through the words of Jesus that, the, that the, the cadence of the Spirit is called out in our lives. Are we engaged? Do we remember faithfully the words of Jesus? There, it's not rocket science. There's nothing complicated about it. Um, and, and it speaks to um, the simple importance of rhythms in our life, producing rhythms in our life where we are engaging, hearing, and engaging the words of Jesus on a regular basis. We can't walk in step with the Spirit. We can't walk in step with the Spirit if the only time we encounter the words of Jesus is on Sunday mornings. I'm not enough. Okay, I will gladly say that. There. My ego may be big sometimes. I deal with big ego just like anybody else. But I'm not enough. I am not the end of what, what we do um, at this central time of worship when we read and hear the word proclaimed is important. But this is by no means enough for you to learn to walk in cadence with the Spirit, to walk in step with the Spirit. The words of Jesus are uncovered um, on a daily basis. The words of Jesus are uncovered. This is why we do the small group kind of thing. Um, this is why we do, um, that's it's why we have the rock on Sunday nights for um, junior, senior, high youth. Um, it, it's why we do, why we engage in life together in other venues at other times on a regular basis because we need to hear the words of Jesus in order to walk in step with the Spirit of the living God. Go back, begin with this. Um, this week, look at that passage that we just read, 5, 19 through 26 of Galatians, and memorize it. Read it, dwell on it. And let those words, the, that one verse that describes the fruit of the Spirit, let that um, saturate you this week. Let, that, let those words be the cadence of your day-to-day -day life, your moment-by-moment -moment life. And let, and let the Lord then um, be at work in you. You make space, you provide opportunity for the Spirit um, to be at work in you when you do that. And in so doing, we discover, um, we discover joy, life, um, God's true purposes for us. Let's pray. Holy God.